Why don't we get underway? Um, I'm Dan Kastner. I'm the scientific director of the uh, National Human Genome Research Institute. And it is my enormous uh, pleasure to have the opportunity to kick things off uh, this afternoon for the 15th installment of the Jeffrey M. Trent Lecture in Cancer Genomics. And this is really a lecture series of rock stars uh, in honor of a rock star. And of course, the rock star that we're talking about that this lecture series honors is Jeff Trent, uh, who was the inaugural uh, founding scientific director of uh, the, uh, at the time, the National Center for Human Genome Research, later to become uh, the NHGRI. And Jeff uh, arrived on campus back in 1993 uh, with Francis. And uh, before coming here, Jeff had been uh, the director of basic science uh, at the University of Michigan uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center. And he came with Francis with the mission of establishing a new uh, intramural research program on campus. And through his vision, through his energy, through the dint of his hard work, uh, he quickly created uh, an entity that was an engine that transformed uh, the intramural program of uh, the NIH. And I remember, I was here at the time, uh, and it really infused genetics and genomics uh, into the culture of, of the intramural program of the NIH. And of course, uh, through Jeff's uh, uh, auspices, uh, it became uh, really a powerhouse of genetics and genomics, not only in the United States, but around the world. Uh, during the time that Jeff was here, uh, he was, of course, uh, the chief of the cancer genetics branch and made seminal contributions in terms of uh, uh, cancer genetics and genomics, particularly with regard to transcriptomics uh, and the study of, of uh, cancers. Jeff uh, graduated, so to speak, I guess you could say, uh, back in 2002 uh, and left to become the founder of TGen. Uh, the Translational Genomics uh, Institute uh, in uh, Tucson, uh, Arizona. And he has been prodigious there as well. And we were fortunate enough to have him at our silver anniversary celebration last fall. And uh, he certainly has not been resting on his laurels and, in fact, has exciting uh, new uh, initiatives uh, that he set up uh, between TGen and the City of Hope uh, Hospital. So in any case, um, in 2003, uh, Eric, uh, who became the second scientific director of uh, uh, the NHGRI, uh, very uh, wisely thought to create a lecture series in Jeff Trent's uh, honor. Uh, and this lecture series has been a pantheon of leaders uh, in the field of genetics and genomics, beginning with Janet Rowley uh, in 2003 and including Nobel Prize winners, uh, clairvoyants, you name it. It's been a really uh, amazing uh, group of people. So at this point, I think I'm going to step back and turn things over to my colleague and friend and boss, uh, Eric Green, who will uh, introduce this year's Trent Lecturer. Eric? Thank you, Dan. Well, picking up on what Dan just mentioned, since the start of the Trent Lectureship, NHGRI has brought an amazing group of researchers to NIH each year to give this annual lecture, including multiple Nobel laureates and others who have truly made transformative contributions to science. Uh, just by way of don't let his youthful appearance fool you, though. Today's speaker, Dr. Jay Shinduri, rightfully fits within that group of legendary researchers. Now, Jay is a man of many titles. He's professor of genome sciences at the University of Washington, investigator in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, director of the Allen Discovery Center for Cell Lineage, and director of the Broadman Beatty Institute for Precision Medicine. Uh, but none of those impressive titles should come as a surprise to you if you follow Jay's meteoric career, as I have for the last 12 years. Jay earned his AB degree from Princeton University and then an MD and a PhD degree from Harvard Medical School. He then got out of the gates very quickly in establishing an independent research program at the University of Washington, and he sort of has never looked back since. Jay's research focuses on the development and application of genomic technologies for understanding genome function and biology, and he's really been center stage 
in efforts to make genome sequencing faster, cheaper, and more readily applicable to many different areas of biomedical research. For example, his group was pivotal in the earliest pioneering efforts that reduced to practice the ability to efficiently sequence the protein coding portion of the human genome, otherwise known as exome sequencing, and then apply such an approach to identify disease-causing gene mutations. Jay's technical innovations did not stop there, and his lab has amassed a remarkable track record of applying their methods to compelling scientific problems, and his cross-disciplinary group continues to develop new technologies. I am sure this is the kind of things he's going to describe in his talk today. I truly regard Jay as one of the most highly accomplished genomics researchers in this decade, full stop. But I'm not the only one with that opinion. Award committees have noticed the same thing. A sampling of his recent awards include 2012 Kurt Stern Award from the American Society of Human Genetics, the 2013 NIH Pion Director's Pioneer Award, the 2014 Hudson Alpha Prize for Life Sciences, 2014 Scripps Genomic Medicine Award, the 2018 Richard and Carol Hertzberg Prize for Technology Innovation. He was named to Cells 40 Under 40 in 2014. Oh, by the way, earlier this year, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, of which Jay is a member, gave Jay the Richard Lousberry Award for his pioneering work in what was known as the second wave of genomics. But besides all of his accomplishments, what I really want to point out is how incredibly generous he is with his time that he gives to the broader scientific community, and in particular to NIH. Shortly after I became an institute director, I uh, uh, asked and he accepted an appointment on um, NHGRI's advisory council. He hadn't even finished, I think, his full term on that when the NIH director grabbed him and also asked him to serve on his advisory committee to the director, which he still does. And in fact, Jay has just spent the last day and a half uh, at the advisory committee to the director's lecture. And, um, and, and in meanwhile, you would think the NIH director would be incredibly exhausted and so overwhelmed having just led a day and a half of his advisory committee. But Jay was attractive enough as a scientific opportunity that the director is even here immediately after his advisory committee to hear Jay's talk. And, uh, and, and as I had done multiple times, the NIH director, Francis Collins, has used Jay in many ways as a member of his advisory committee to the director, including having him serve on the working group um, for the Precision Medicine Initiative that led to the launch of the All of Us Research Program. So the service that he just constantly gives to the NIH has been appreciated both by the peers that serve with him, but also by the NIH, and I know I speak on behalf of Francis Collins and being very grateful for his wise counsel. So I'm delighted to turn the podium over to an outstanding genomics researcher, a highly productive NHGRI and NIH grantee, a generous contributor to NHGRI and NIH, and someone who I personally regard as a good friend, a colleague, and a trusted advisor, Dr. Jay Shinduri. Okay. Thank you, Eric, for that uh, extremely uh, kind introduction. It's a, it's a real honor and a privilege to be here. Um, and for a lecture, you know, to, to this institute in particular, um, to which I, I feel uh, deeply connected at, at many levels, putting even aside the fact that you fund me. Um, but, but, you know, the, 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 the personal connections and the, the associations I've had in council and, and in other ways, I think, um, have really tied me to this group, and this is really my um, community. So it's great to, to be here and to have a chance to tell you about some of our recent work. And, and um, uh, so just to, you know, so, so broadly speaking, and it's nice to have an audience, I don't necessarily have to apologize or try and mitigate this in any way, but our lab is a technology development lab, and, and kind of the common thread that's run through um, our work uh, uh, the whole way has been you know, this idea of can we multiplex biology, right, at, at every level and as many flavors as we can, right? So just um, work I won't talk about going back, but if you think about all of these technologies like next-gen sequencing, exome sequencing, um, massively parallel reporter assays, kind of the common thread here of this and other work is really the, the performance of, of multiple, multiple experiments within a single volume, so to speak, right? That's, a, that's a, a theme here, and it's a very technical theme as opposed to a disease. Or a, or a particular uh, physiologic mechanism, but I think it's still a powerful one um, and still has a lot of uh, uh, runway, I think. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about three very different projects. Uh, uh, almost all of this work is, I mean, all of it's funded by the NIH and, and a, a fair bit of it by NHGRI in particular. Um, they're very different projects and trying to answer, um, I think, old questions with, with new methods. 
Um, but a common theme is this, this idea of, of multiplexing biology, so to speak. So just to dive here into the first one, um, this is work from uh, an MD-PhD student, uh, uh, Greg Finley, and um, a research professor at UW, um, Leah Starita, um, uh, uh, in my group. And so uh, just to frame the problem, so, um, so BRCA1, I'm sure uh, the vast majority of you are familiar with it as a, a poster child for um, genomic medicine, right? This is a gene for which we know that having a, uh, uh, a pathogenic mutation will lead to a markedly increased risk for early onset breast uh, and ovarian cancer. Uh, it's probably been more sequenced than any other uh, single um, uh, uh, set of genes, if we're talking about BRCA1 and 2. Uh, first mapped um, in 1990 by Mary Claire King, uh, subsequently um, cloned and um, uh, the subject of a great deal of both scientific and legal focus. Uh, and you know, one, of the, one of the distinguishing features here, which is probably only true for about 50 or so genes right now, is that if you, if you know that you have a path, if, if you know that an individual has a pathogenic mutation, it is an actionable piece of information, right? There is something you can do that will make a difference for outcomes for that patient. The challenge uh, for this and, and 50 other genes and what will undoubtedly be an increasing number of genes is that even though we have implicated the gene, uh, we do not always know which variants are pathogenic, right? And so um, simplifying things somewhat, uh, one might regard synonymous mutations as benign, nonsense mutations as pathogenic, but the stuff in between, both, both missense and regulatory, is, is challenging to interpret. So, you know, there are different, there are different approaches for, for solving this, right? One, one of the kind of the, a, a classic approach is to look for other patients that have that particular variant and see what happens to them so that you can make interpretations around future uh, uh, patients with the same variant. The challenge is that most, most specific variants are exceedingly rare. So even in cohorts exceeding 100,000 individuals, you might only see a particular variant once, right? So that, 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 that paradigm, which is kind of represented up here, works, data sharing or genetics, but its throughput is low and we might well have to sequence everyone on the planet before we can extend it to every variant. Uh, computational prediction is another approach. It's very scalable, right? You can make a prediction for anything. Um, uh, the challenge is, is validity, right? So we and others have developed methods. So our, our particular method is called CAD, which I think works better than average, right? But when you're talking about patients, that's obviously not good enough, right? Um, uh, and so, so this is this is challenge. And so, what we've been uh, the, the third category here, uh, functional assays are, are by and large considered to be a valid approach, you know, experimentally characterizing an individual variant. But historically, this has been done in an ad hoc kind of piecemeal manner, often very retrospectively, where it may or may not be of use to an individual patient, um, uh, rather than in a systematic uh, way. Okay, so um, over the last few years, we and others have been trying to develop methods for multiplexing these sorts of functional approaches in the context of regulatory elements, but also in the context of, of variants that impact genes. And so the basic uh, uh, broad paradigm uh, is as follows, right? So one synthetic, uses any, uh, any number of synthetic methods to build a library of uh, variants of a particular sequence of interest. One then introduces those into some biological system, let's say a population of cells, uh, and then performs a phenotypic assay. Uh, and then finally, using perhaps sequencing, perhaps something else, um, one can you know, quantify the relative effect sizes of, of individual mutations in this population. And so a key point here, well, two key points. One is that this is one experimental workflow, so I'm characterizing many mutations, but I'm doing it as part of one experiment. And kind of the, the follow-on from that is a powerful aspect of this relative to approaches where you are characterizing one mutation at a time is that you get a distribution of effect sizes, right? And that's a powerful thing to have when you're trying to interpret any one mutation to see where it sits relative to all other possible mutations. Okay, so um, classically, you know, functional assays, people have been doing these for decades typically on episomal reporter vectors, right? You put the cDNA or your, you know, you've got your regulatory element, you make variants, and you look at them. And the, the, off, the, you know, the frequent criticism of this approach is that, well, we don't know how different chromatin on episomes are, is relative to chromatin in the native genome. You're also, you know, if you're looking at a cDNA as opposed to a gene in its native exon intron structure, um, you don't know whether you're missing some key parts about native regulation, right? And so, this is not the genome, right? And it, it, but nonetheless, it's what we could do. 
Um, we no longer have um, quite the same level of uh, excu excusability, right? With the development of CRISPR, one can now make changes directly to uh, uh, sequences of interest in their native context. Um, so um, this topic doesn't likely, I hope by now, doesn't need much introduction, but just to, as a, as a brief refresher on to the, the ways in which one can use CRISPR, right? So CRISPR is uh, generally used as one approach to introduce a double-stranded break to a particular place in the genome. That's at least one way of using it. And then if you, if you, if you provide no sort of nothing to the cell to repair that, double-stranded break. It will try to repair it just by joining the ends. Sometimes it will make a mistake, which leads to typically to deletions or insertions. Uh, and this can be used to disrupt you know, genes. So for example, by introducing a frame shift. The other way in which it can be used, or one other way, is to exploit homology-directed repair, uh, where you provide a, a repair template to the vicinity of where you're cutting. The cell uses that repair template, and you introduce a precise edit precise variant. Okay. So we're mostly going to be talking about this avenue here. Um, so saturation genome editing, which is a, a method that Greg, um, together with another graduate student, uh, uh, sorry, undergraduate, now a graduate student in Jonathan Pritchard's lab, uh, Evan Boyle, came up with a few years ago, is this approach where we try to multiplex the process of genome editing with homology-directed repair. So in a nutshell, we have a population of cells we are introducing a cut to one particular location in the genomes of those cells. So there's one place we're cutting. But rather than providing one repair template, we're providing a library of repair templates, right? And so this cut can get repaired in any number of ways, right? It might not get repaired at all, in which case you have NHEJ and an insertion or deletion, but you might introduce one of these variants that you programmed on a microarray, right? And you end up with a population of cells that each have a different edit. Okay, so, so you know, we developed that method. It took us a few years to kind of think about how we should actually use it. And so Greg had this, um, I think, remarkably um, good insight from keen leading, reading of the literature where there was a paper um, um, from Thrill uh, Brimmelkamp's group, one of the first CRISPR screens, which was done in this, this cell line called HAP1. This is, a, um, this is a cell line that was derived from a cancer cell line. Uh, but uh, uh, as a particular property of being nearly completely haploid, right? So there's only one copy of the genome, of every chromosome. And what Greg noticed in the data from that paper was that it, it appeared, according to their results, that BRCA1 was essential, right? Meaning that if you, if you, if you cut it and introduce a, 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 a frame shift, the cells would die. And we confirmed this in our own lab. Here we're cutting it, uh, the cells at one locus, HBRT1. Cells are fine. We cut it BRCA1, they die. Right? Um, okay, and then just as a corollary to this, we also looked at other, uh, you know, so, so one important question here is, is, is why are they dying, right? So, so if you're thinking about these functional assays and trying to relate them to patients, as we ultimately are going to be doing, um, is the function that we're, you know, is, is resulting in cell death in this system have anything to do with why a patient with a BRCA1 mutation develops breast cancer, right? And that's a very good question to ask. One suggestion that it might have something to do with it, uh, well, two things. So one is that these, are, these, are, these cells are ES-like, embryonic stem cell-like, and, and mouse ES cells are often used as a model for studying BRCA1 variants in these kinds of functional assays. The second is that if you look at other genes that are essential in the cell line, all the, all the homology-directed repair genes are, are on that list, or many of them are, suggesting that that pathway is actually important for these cell survivals. And I should have said this, but I didn't, but I'll say it now. And this is going to be a little bit confusing. So I'm using the phrase HDR or homology-directed repair in two different ways. So on one hand, it is the mechanism by which we are repairing CRISPR cuts. In addition to that, it happens to be the physiological function of the cell that is thought to be important for BRCA1's role in breast cancer, right? So we're, we have the two things together, and I'm kind of using the term in both ways, just to clarify that. So, but, but the fact that other HDR genes are essential in the cell line gives us some confidence that maybe we are capturing the physiologically relevant function. So BRCA1 is an enormous gene, right, stretching over 81 kilobasis, and, and just the ORF is 5,500 basis. Um, and so, you know, within the space of a 
an MD-PhD's uh, PhD component. We didn't necessarily want to do the whole thing. Um, and so instead, um, uh, we set about picking particular parts of the gene that we thought would be the most fruitful. And so there are these, there are these two domains, the ring domain and BR the BRCT domain, that are both, one, thought to be uh, critical for this HDR activity of BRCA1, and two, happen to be where all of the known pathogenic missense variants of BRCA1 lie, literally all of them, right? So if we're going to focus our effort and time somewhere as a proof of concept, it made, to do, made sense to do so on these, on these 13 exons, right? Okay, so the actual experiments that, that Greg and colleagues did were as follows. We proceeded one exon at a time, made a cut in these HAP1 cells, uh, and then repaired with a library of every possible single nucleotide change of that exon, right? So we're making every possible swap out, not only of the exon, but going about 10 basis into each intron on either side, right? So in total, about 100 base pair region, right? Um, and so in, in total, we did this across um, uh, uh, 13 exons, which added up to around 4,000 point mutations. So just to drill into the, the rest of the experiment, focusing on one exon in particular. So one challenge here is that even after a lot of optimization and even engineering the cell line, this process of HDR is not very efficient in, um, in mammalian cells. Like, so as Meru's work, it's, it's fantastically efficient in yeast, right? But not so much in, in um, mammalian cells. And so the nice part about the system, in addition to the other aspects I mentioned, is that when we introduce frame shifts, which are the other 80% here, those cells just die. Right? So we don't have that background. So we introduce these edits, and then we simply wait. Right? And the expectation that if this is essential, if we're introducing a pathogenic mutation or, or a function compromising mutation, those cells should die, whereas cells with benign mutations should live. So now this is just plots showing the, 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 day, the uh, enrichment of distribution, the distribution of counts for different uh, variants over time. And if we um, look at this as a ratio of enrichment or depletion over the time course, comparing the 11 and 5 day time point, and here we're just looking at nonsense mutations and synonymous mutations, we get a nice bimodal distribution, right? With a handful of exceptions I'll mention again later. But for the most part, synonymous mutations are not depleted, whereas the nonsense mutations are depleted. Now, if we look at the missense mutations, we get a nice bimodal separation, right? Where for this particular exon, about half of them group with the synonymous mutations and about half with the, the um, nonsense mutations. Okay, another way of viewing the same data. This is looking along the exon, um, uh, uh, and, and the colors correspond to these different functional categories. And we're just looking at whether particular changes you know, increase or, or result in depletion. And so just a few phenomena I want to point out. One is that the nonsense you know, uniformly go down, as you can see, the synonymous and which are, and in the regulatory mutations and the synonymous are lumped together here, but the ones kind of in the exon you can see are by and large uh, uh, benign. But looking into the, at the junction, we see this particular junction, it tends to be pretty unpredictable from junction to junction. Not only the canonical splice pair of, of, of splice bases right at the junction, but also the first uh, coding um, uh, triplet as well as seven bases into the intron you know, that the gene is almost completely intolerant to changes, right? And this varies by, by junction, but this is a particularly striking one. Another cool thing is if you look here, you can see a handful of synonymous changes that result in depletion, right? These blue lines going down. So what's going on there? So one cool thing here is that you can actually look at the RNA levels. We can sequence the RNA and ask, you know, looking at the point mutations on those RNA molecules, ask about their levels. And if you look at, 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 at these, you know, these, these, apparently non-functional synonymous changes, we see that many of them do in fact um, uh, result in, uh, really all of them result in depletion of RNA levels, right? And if we look in detail, we see often they're creating new splice sites and probably compromising function that way. There are also missense changes, which you might naively or naturally think have their effects mediated by changes to the protein, but in fact may be acting at the RNA level, right? Okay. So, um, so altogether, we were able to hit about 96.5% of the roughly 4,000 possible point mutations in these 13 exons that we targeted. Um, here's the overall distribution, right? 
Um, the handful of exceptions where we see, so, so if we now, okay, so important question to ask here. Um, you know, so we see the patterns we expect for the most part. One question is, you know, is this actually valid clinically, coming back to what I said earlier? And if we look at, 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 if we look at where mutations that are scored in ClinVar, which is kind of the, the database of clinically adjudicated variants in, in genes like BRCA1, we see very strong agreement between our data and, and those calls, right? Um, with, 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 again, a handful of exceptions. Um, this, is, this is a little bit uh, 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 overly fair to ourselves in the sense that we're including um, nonsense and synonymous mutations here, but even if we only look at the missense mutations, we see good agreement. The handful of exceptions we've drilled into further, including by looking at how and why they were included in ClinVar. And in each of the cases, we were able to convince ourselves uh, that, that there's a reason that they should not have been included and where our annotations may actually be correct. Um, and so obviously these, these individual cases, edge cases, need careful attention, but I think it's also important to recognize that databases like ClinVar are not perfect, right? Um, okay, and, and uh, uh, yeah, so in these 13 exons, we've achieved nearly perfect classification with these experimental approaches. We've got some variants that fall in this intermediate group, and then you can get some interesting statistics out of this, like the proportion of missense changes or overall changes that are functional versus non-functional, as well as we were surprised by the rather substantial number of variants that appear to have their effects by mediating disruptions of expression rather than acting at the protein level. Okay, and we're hoping this is a, a, a kind of a paradigm potentially moving forward if we can scale this further. And I think within six months, we've had quite a bit of enthusiasm from national bodies like Enigma that try to you know, support common standards for uh, variant adjudication where they are quickly now adopting these and the variants are all in ClinVar and, and that kind of thing. Okay, second part here. This is a completely different question. Uh, and this is work that I should say is part of the um, ENCODE in, in, in in consortium, ENCODE 4, in, partic in particular this new part of ENCODE that focuses on um, uh, the development and, and uh, implementation of, of, of technologies for functional characterization of the non-coding genome. So one of the kind of the pivotal challenges in this area, um, so ENCODE has been enormously successful in characterizing uh, candidate regulatory elements um, uh, uh, throughout the genome in a broad diversity of cell lines. Um, our, our, our belief that these actually are what they, we think they are um, is, is based on a historically small, like a small number of uh, paradigmatic examples. Um, and the vast majority, we haven't actually functionally tested to confirm that they are what we think they are and moreover, to understand them more deeply. So in particular, uh, the question that I think is, is quite fascinating and important, particularly if we want to effectively follow up on genome-wide association studies, is what genes do these elements actually regulate, right? And there are correlative approaches for trying to, to, to get at this, but we, we, um, we're, we're short on, on uh, uh, functional methods. Okay, so the, the approach that we've been um, developing is actually inspired by human genetics and by um, the EQTL framework in particular, right? So if you think about what we're doing with EQTLs, um, uh, when we're, you know, if we're looking at what enhancers control a particular gene, for example, you have many individuals. Each individual is a combination of a different um, uh, set of genetic variants throughout their genome. And then we also make expression measurements on this population, and then we perform a bunch of statistical tests. And in every test, we're saying, you know, if we look at this particular variant, we look at the subset of individuals that have that variant, and we compare expression of nearby genes um, for any sort of correlation with, with what variant you have at that particular position, and this is how we find EQTLs, right? And then we're leveraging the same population again and again and again, basically different combinations of individuals that have the other variants, right? We can, we can use that to do additional tests, right? So we're, we're really exploiting you know, the random assortment of variation in the human to get as much as we can out of this. Okay, so now, um, you know, th this, this works, and you can use this kind of framework, for example, to link a variant and an enhancer to regulation of a particular gene, but there are some important challenges. So one is that the framework is limited in scope to standing or common variation, right? You need the variant to be common enough that you're powered enough to actually see an effect. It also has to be, happen to be a variant that falls in an enhancer and disrupts its function in order for you to find something. And the second limitation is population history of humans, where because of linkage disequilibrium, 
you might have a large number of variants in a haplotype block. You associate the haplotype block with the change in expression, but you don't know which variant is actually causal for the effect that you observe. Okay, so now inspired by this framework, kind of imagine a, a slightly different world here where rather than people, we have cells, right? Um, and, and rather than naturally occurring genetic variation as our perturbations, we have programmed CRISPR-mediated perturbations, okay? And so, so but similar to, similar to QTL studies, every, instead of human cell, every cell has a different combination of perturbations, right? Um, but, you know, and, and like EQTL studies, we're going to be leveraging the single data set where we've genotyped all the cells and we've expression phenotyped all the cells. We're going to be leveraging this again and again to look at different combinations of cells that harbor different, you know, that happen to harbor a particular enhancer uh, perturbation versus the subset that don't and, and looking for changes of expression of genes that are located nearby, right? So it's extremely analogous. Instead of CRISPR with the double-stranded breaks I mentioned earlier, we're using CRISPR-I where a large crab domain is hooked up. And so we're not actually introducing a cut. Rather, we're kind of epigenetically shutting down the enhancer where the guide targets this, this complex too. Okay, so we're not the first ones to, to work in this, in this general area, I should mention. There have been quite a few papers in, from a, a number of groups basically um, developing some of the key tools here um, and uh, applying them. But typically in a bulk fashion, right, where you've got a population of cells, you've, let's say you put a GFP reporter on this gene, you're now introducing CRISPR-I perturbations to the vicinity of this gene, you're sorting the cells maybe into high and low expression bins, and you're comparing which guides are present in each bin. So this is a, it, it, it's multiplex in a sense, in the sense that you're looking at many guides and many enhancers, but you've really built an assay for one gene, right? and really focus your efforts around that. And that obviously takes a lot of work to try and build a gene-specific assay. In contrast, what we're trying to do here is a generalizable framework where we can look at many candidate enhancers' potential effects on many transcripts in a genome-wide way that we don't have to, um, we don't have to optimize for, for any particular target, right? Um, and, and again, we're leveraging this one experiment. We've, we're going we're gonna to introduce guides. Well, I'll just go through it here. So, okay, so, so um, in the actual experiments we did, so I'll talk through two experiments. One was a pilot, one was more at scale. In the pilot experiment, we tried to target 1,000 enhancers across the genome in K562 cells. We're putting in 15 guides per cell, and I'll mention, talk in a bit about how we're doing that. Um, and we're profiling, you know, 50,000 individuals, where the individuals are cells. And we're really analyzing this exactly like an EQTL study, um, literally. Um, Okay, so what, what enhancers are we choosing? So we're, we're basing our decisions on the you know, data from the ENCODE project uh, for uh, K562 cells. So in this particular experiment, taking the kinds of marks that you might associate with enhancers in the cell line and targeting them specifically, right? Because our question here really is trying to figure out what genes they regulate and learn something about that. Okay, so yeah, so we've, we have a bunch of, you know, quite a variable, you know, it's not one criteria, but we actually have a lot of representation of a lot of different patterns of, of chromatin marks here. Okay, so how do we do this? We're introducing the, the, the guide RNAs via lentivirus at a high multiplicity of infection, right? So every cell is getting a random combination of, on average, 15 of these guides. Um, then we perform single cell RNA-seq, in this case on the 10x uh, genomics platform to measure expression. And one key point here is that we're able to take advantage of a, a vector developed by um, Christoph Vox's group and uh, uh, by Datlinger et al. described here called CropSeq, where the guide RNA actually gets expressed as a, um, as a Paul II transcript as well. So you can pick it up in your, your modified 10x genomics assay, which there's some tweaks here um, that we described in this paper down here. One of the, if you're in this space, one of the key advantages of this vector over similar methods like PerturbSeq is that it kind of brilliantly avoids this phenomenon of lentiviral recombination that can otherwise scramble associations between barcodes and guides. It's a fairly nuanced technical point, but it's a very important one if you're actually trying to set up an experiment in the space. Um, okay, and the key point here is multiplexing gets us a lot of power, right? So by doing 15 guides per cell, we're actually able to get the same power 
um, uh, with 50,000 cells, profiling 50,000 cells, as would be, you know, we would need 750,000 cells if we were only putting in one guide per cell. Okay, then as I said, we're performing, you know, essentially like cis EQTL tests, where we're comparing the expression of genes that have or don't have a particular guide. We're, we're looking at all genes within a megabase of the enhancer that that guide is targeting, right? Which is kind of typically what you do in, in these cis EQTL studies. So as a positive control, we can look at enhancers. I'm sorry, not enhancers, at promoters. If we target CRISPR-I to promoters of particular genes, and you know, basically do the same thing, our strong expectation is that we should be knocking down the gene that that, that promoter belongs to. And in fact, you know, here 94% of the time, we do get detectable knockdown of the, of the transcript um, uh, when we do these association tests on guides that are targeting the promoter itself. One thing that's striking in kind, of, in, in kind of trying to design this experiment and look for positive controls is how few, like hands down, for sure enhancers there are where you definitely know the, the target gene, even in a cell line like K562 that has been studied to death. Um, and so here our positive controls are the beta globin LCR, which of course is one of the kind of paradigmatic examples. And in that case, you know, here we are targeting an enhancer and we do in fact see um, knockdown of the, the appropriate globin transcripts as, as expected. Okay, so now what about the actual experiment, uh, the experimental guides? So here, these are the ones where we're targeting an enhancers in orange, and then we have some non-targeting controls in gray. And what I'm plotting here is a QQ plot, so often used for GWAS studies or EQTL studies, which is a distribution of expected versus observed p-values. And as you can see, we get good agreement with the expected distribution for the non-targeting controls, but we have this kind of um, uptick in uh, an excess of significant p-values for the actual, uh, uh, when we're targeting enhancers, right? Okay, so in total, you know, targeting about 1,000 of these candidate enhancers, we get about 145 of these enhancer gene associations that come up as significant under an empirical FDR of 3.5%. We call these CRISPR QTLs. And um, just for clarity, we are seeing all kinds of things, right? So it's not one enhancer, one gene all the time. Rather, we have some enhancers that target multiple genes, some genes that are targeted by multiple enhancers that we tested, um, but 145 of these unique pairings. Okay, you know, 145 out of around 1,000 tested, so about 15%. So I just want to bear that number in mind for consistency with the next experiment that I'll tell you about. So this is just showing one example. This is... Um, a gene uh, ENM, or NMU, uh, neuromedian median U. Uh, and here we're targeting, um, so this is our non-targeting control. So here, these, these plots are each just showing no gRNA versus yes gRNA, comparing the distribution of expression values for large numbers of cells. And here we see no difference for a non-targeting control. We look at the promoter. So here, if we're targeting the promoter and looking at that guide, we see a big difference, 77% knockdown. We look at this target candidate enhancer here, doesn't appear to be significantly associated. It's kind of a weak, enhance, weak, you know, weak biochemical marks. Um, but we look out here where we actually had three different elements that we were targeting that happened to be kind of clustered together. We get consistently strong knockdown of the NMU transcript, right? So here over a distance of, of roughly 50 kilobases, we can make a reasonably strong assertion that we have uh, a cluster of enhancers that regulate NMU expression. Okay, so now, you know, so now we, we tried to scale this up and target 5,000 enhancers um, uh, with many more cells and a higher number of guides per, per cell for hopefully a more sensitive experiment. Um, we tried to do this in a little more, I'm not going to go through all the details here, but a slightly more um, intelligent way based on uh, what we learned from the first experiment about what might be a hit and what might not. Um, uh, and again, just really just a, at many levels, just a bigger experiment. But you know, profiling roughly 200,000 cells where Given the MOI we had, we would have had to pro profile 6.5 6 million cells to achieve the same power if we hadn't been multiplexing. Okay, so we ended up with, with so just basically the exact same framework and empirical FDR of 10%, we ended up with uh, about 660 of these CRISPR QTLs. So again, about out of about 5,000 tested, so again, you know, roughly um, you know, north of 10%, but less than 20% um, of these CRISPR QTLs. Okay, so, um, so how can we, you know, what, what determines of our 5,000 targets, which ones are actually coming up here? So one thing we can, you know, we can look at 
the strength of various encode marks and whether they're actually predictive of whether something will end up as an EQ tail. And in fact, they are, right? So here, looking, for example, at H3K27 acetylation, the strongest quintile of peak strength does do a better job of predicting success in this assay. Um, other marks, you know, P300 uh, does the same. Um, H3K4 methylation, monomethylation, um, less so. But you can imagine using these kinds of data, which I would say are not a, you know, it's not really a gold standard till we're going and deleting each element, but I think it's closer to a gold standard than we are right now. You know, we can use these to train better models of how to predict enhancer gene relationships and understand our false positive and false negative rates a little bit better. Other kinds of data also line up with this. So here, for example, looking at high c data, uh, which has been deeply sampled in this particular cell line by Rao et al. And we can see that if we look at um, our CRISPR QTLs, we do see a strong enrichment for um, loops over a distance. That being said, it's also important to recognize that there's a lot of loops that did not end up as functional interactions as our data in our data, and a good number of CRISPR QTLs that are not predicted by loops. Right. So these associations give us some more confidence. But it's also telling us something about the, you know, the, the fact that you know, we're, we're looking at the elephant a lot of different ways and not always seeing exactly the same thing. OK, so for me, the highlight of this whole experiment was this question, which is something I think has never really been empirically asked. Right? We talk about how far enhancers are from the genes they regulate. People often cite the most extreme examples, right? um, uh, where the megabase, two megabases. And that, there are certainly real examples like this. But how, you know, what, is the, what does the distribution look like, right? That's an important question. And I'm not saying this experiment is perfect. It certainly isn't. But I think it is a systematic effort where we, we know exactly how we designed it. So this is a distribution of all the tests that we did in terms of distance from the element that we tested to the promoter that we were testing against, right? The median distance here is 440 kilobases. This is the distribution of CRISPR QTL hits. Right, where we see this very strong, you know, we definitely have some out here that we believe are real, including that 50 KB example I showed. But the vast majority of associations that were successful are pretty close to the gene that they're targeting. Right? So um, a, a frequent thing to do is, in these kinds of analyses historically is to just, if you're trying to figure out what gene an enhancer regulates, is to take the closest gene. Does that actually work? So here we're looking at the, the closest expressed gene to the, the hit. And we do actually see that, you know, ballpark half the time, um, maybe even a bit more than that, the closest gene is the one that, that is regulated. But there are a good number of, of examples, or let's say a third, where, where that's not the case, right? Um, and, you know, another concern here that, that, you know, as soon as you see this, you're like, well, maybe it's just it's all right up against the promoter. Um, and that's not actually the case. If we zoom into this 25 kilobase window, we see they're actually kind of uniformly distributed across that window with only slight enrichment here in the final five kilobases. And we're not considering anything within a, within a kilobase of the actual TSS. Okay? And again, the kind of information that can be used to build empirically predictive models right, of these sorts of links. Okay, so that's, that's that. Um, third part here, totally, again, complete different, different topic. Uh, how do we interpret signal from genome-wide association studies? This is work from uh, uh, Darren Kusanovich, who was a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, is now a professor at the University of Arizona, and Andrew Hill, who until three days ago was a grad student in my lab, um, uh, and, and they worked together on this. Okay, so um, as, we, as you, know, you all know, uh, G GWAS studies have, uh, you know, depending on glass half full, kind of glass half empty, there are now over 100,000 reproducible associations to common diseases, right? Um, uh, and we've learned things like that the signal largely maps to non-coding regions. Um, and we've also learned things about the architecture of disease in other ways. So for example, um, uh, it's, it's largely small effect sizes in, in these non-coding regions that collectively explain a substantial fraction of heritability. But moving to the next stage of actually trying to nail the genes has been challenging in part because of some of the problems I highlighted earlier like linkage disequilibrium and not knowing what genes a particular variant, non-coding regulatory variant, actually regulates, right? Um, okay, the, the, uh, in the last um, couple years, and again, I think people are probably familiar with this, but in the, over the last decade, really, we've seen this explosion of single cell technologies. And I'm going to come back to the GWAS. I made a bit of a transition there. Um, 
explosion of technologies at a logarithmic scale, or exponential scale, where every year you're seeing almost an order of magnitude increase in the kinds of studies that one can do um, with these technologies. So, okay, so I'm going to talk about our, some of our single cell work, and then I'm going to come back to how this relates to GWAS towards the end. Um, so our particular flavor that, that we developed together with uh, Cole Trapnell's group and um, collaborators at Illumina, in particular Frank Steamer's group, um, is this idea of combinatorial indexing. And the question we started with is, can we, um, uh, much like you sequence without isolating each molecule in next-gen sequencing, um, can we profile the molecular contents of large numbers of cells without ever actually isolating single cells? So we start with um, some, some large number of cells. These can be nuclei cells. They can be fresh. They can be fixed. They can be frozen. Um, we split them out to some number of wells on a plate. Um, and then we do the following. So we, so the procedure I'm going to describe to you is, is kind of, it's, it's a combinatorial indexing strategy where we are going to be labeling, we're going to, the, our ideal endpoint is that we've labeled the nucleic acid contents of each cell in a unique way that's different from every other cell in the population. So the way that we do this is to leave the cells intact, distribute them to these wells, and then to start performing in situ molecular reactions inside the cell or nucleus, right? So in the particular example I'll show here, we're just, um, you know, we're, let's say we're using reverse transcriptase to, uh, you know, make first strand cDNA, but we're appending a barcode, right? Um, and that barcode is inside the cells, which we've permeabilized. We then pool the cells from all these wells back together, and we split them back out to a new set of wells. Um, and then we perform some other form of molecular indexing using kind of standard biochemistry and again, kind of inside the cell. And then we're, we're all done. We can basically um, uh, uh, recover all of the nucleic acids, which have been labeled with these combinations of indexes, uh, lyse the cells, get them all together, and then sequence those molecules. And the key point here is that every nucleic acid that we're interested in is now tagged by some set of barcodes that identify what cell, you know, that, that, that are shared if they came from the same cell, right, in principle. Um, this, this is kind of subject to the birthday problem. So by, by pure chance, just like two of us might have the same birthday, two cells might traverse the same combination of wells. So it's not perfect. But you can predict, just like I can predict how many people here have the, that same birthday, you can predict how many of these, quote, collisions we get. And so this was developed um, four years ago now by, by this overall framework by uh, Darren and uh, Riza Daza, who's a research scientist in, in my group. And we call this single cell combinatorial indexing, or SKY. And we and uh, uh, collaborators over the last few years have developed a lot of different flavors of this basic idea. So we started with a TAC-seq for measuring chromatin accessibility, uh, then high c for nuclear architecture. DNA sequencing was developed by Andrew Adie at OHSU, who's a former um, student of mine. Um, transcriptome profiling, which I'll mention briefly on the next slide. Methyl profiling, also by Andrew. And then um, co-assays of chromatin accessibility and expression in the same cells. And recently, we also have a paper on nascent transcription. So really, any kind of standard biochemistry, if you get a little creative, you can adapt it to this basic framework of combinatorial indexing to get, uh, effectively, a, a single-cell version of that assay. OK, so I'm mostly going to talk about single-cell ataxic, but I want to briefly, um, I'll, I'll mention some other things we've done. So Jun Kao in the lab developed this Sky RNA-seq protocol, first round of indexing with a reverse transcriptase, the second one with PCR. Uh, and we first use these to develop, basically make an atlas of transcription of the worm, of the L2 worm, where we're kind of, by getting 40,000 transcriptomes, we're overcovering the cellular content of any single worm, right? So it's instead of 50x coverage of genome, it's 50x coverage of the cells, you could say. Um, and Bob, is, Bob and Cole and others have recently done some really fascinating work that's on BioArchive, if you have a chance to look at it, connecting this back to Selsun's lineage in a really remarkable way. Um, more recently, Jun developed um, this three-round three version of combinatorial indexing, where he himself, in the lab, over about a week and a half, was able to, to profile, I think, uh, you know, what is now, I think, the, one of the largest publicly available data sets of, of uh, single-cell RNA-seq, right? This was a one-and-a-half-week ex experiment that one NovaSeq run, um, in which he profiled uh, two million cells. Um, uh, and here, we, we, we applied it to basically profile mouse embryo organogenesis from E9.5 to E13.5, joined together with a postdoc Malta Spielman. And all the rest of this talk is, I should say, collaborative work with Cole Trapnell's group, who, um, 
who's also in my, my department. And the, I refer you to the paper because I don't have time to talk about this, but the stuff you can see really around development of all the various lineages of the organism is really, um, you know, we've, we've only scratched the surface of what we could potentially look at with these data. Okay, so what, what I am going to talk about in the last, I'll try to get this through in the last four minutes, is, um, is single cell attack seek, where we're doing basically TN5 transposition with an indexed barcode, pooling and splitting, and then an indexed PCR to get the second um, uh, index on there. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Uh, Darren and, and Andrew applied this um, last year to uh, the mouse, and in particular, um, 13 tissues of the adult mouse, effectively a, an atlas of mammalian chromatin accessibility that was as comprehensive as we could get it, and we ended up profiling around 100,000 cells. Um, you know, we get clusters. This is a T-SNE. You know, we can look at, you know, for example, hepatocytes are boring. Astrocytes are more interesting. If different subsets, even at the chromatin accessibility level. Um, I don't want to offend any <laughs> liver people, but uh, at least in the resolution of our data. Um, and so I think, you know, similar, to, analogous to ENCODE, I think there is a lot of value over gene expression data in this kind of regulatory biology, right? Just like I mean, the, the gene regulation parts of ENCODE were in many ways, at least from my perspective, the most exciting relative to just looking at expression. And this is just an example of the kinds of things you can see when you extend that to single cell. And here looking at astrocyte subtype specific regular accessibility, presumably enhancers, right? And, you know, also endothelial cells, right? Uh, uh, subtype specific enhancer. Okay, what does any of this have to do with genome-wide association studies? Okay, so, so um, a couple of years ago, a number of groups, um, including John Stamatonopoulos' group, showed that you do see this enrichment of the signal of GWAS heritability in accessible chromatin of cell types that a, a relevant, I'm oh, sorry, of tissues, this was through ENCODE, so they're looking often at tissues or, or cell lines, um, of, of cell lines or tissues that are, are relevant to the disease in question, right? Um, so if you look at, uh, if you look at um, uh, an, an inflammatory disease, you might see that the, G, the heritability signal partitions to, uh, you know, PBMCs, let's say, or the, or the open chromatin from PBMCs. Okay, can we extend this kind of thinking to single cell resolution uh, uh, chromatin accessibility data sets? And so the challenge here practically is that we have human GWAS data, no mouse GWAS data, and we have a, a mouse atlas of chromatin accessibility, not at least yet, no human atlas of chromatin accessibility. And so how do you bridge these things? So we are related, um, and you can just lift the coordinates over, and it still works amazingly, right? And so we can look at, we can lift over the accessibility coordinates from mouse to human and look at enrichments of heritability from GWAS in those data, right? So, okay, so even if we forget we have single cell data, can we even reproduce what John and others did, you know, and just treat these as individual tissues? And in fact, we, we do see that this kind of works, right? So if we look at uh, neurological disorders, we see enrichment for the prefrontal cortex uh, tissue. If we look at, this is our data, we're just forgetting that we have single cell data and collapsing it, um, and so on and so forth, you, you get it. But now if we look at single cell data, right, or single cell clusters, we have 85 cell types against the GWAS here, which are the, which are the columns, it's much more granular. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by this. If we look at bipolar disorder and the maximal enrichments as far as cell types, we see a strong enrichment for, top enrichments are all for cortical neurons, right? And excitatory neurons in particular, which is kind of what you'd expect based on the biology. In contrast, if you do the same thing for Alzheimer's disease, not a single neuron pops up, right? But rather the top association is with microglia, which as we recently under, only recently understand is probably the, the cell type of principal relevance for Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so now with the availability of UK Biobank, we can just extend the same thing to all 2,500 traits that are, are available there, right? So still with our 85 mile cell types and these 2,500 traits, and this is a lot of fun to play with. We have this all um, online if, if you're interested in, in what cell type is responsible for your left arm subcutaneous fat. Um, <laughs> But here are just a few examples. So looking at gout, you know, the top enrichment is for, you know, not just for kidney, but for kidney proximal tubule and a particular subtype of cells in the proximal tubule. Um, looking at things like emphysema and cystic, uh, systolic blood pressure, we can, they both pin to endothelium, right? But to different beds of, of vasculature, right? So venous lung, venous lung in the case of emphysema by, uh, bronchitis and heart arterial in the case of endothelium. 
right? And then the, the last one I'll end with is just that the pain in your the pain when you walk is in your mind. Um, inhibitory neurons for that one. Okay, so um, yeah, so these are, this is kind of giving you a glimpse. I think these multiplex methods still have a lot of runway in terms of how we can apply them to contemporary and important questions in genomics and 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 biology um, in general. And I'll. Um, yeah, I'll end there and just thank the people in my lab who, who did the work and thank you all for, for listening. Well, Jay, thank you so much for that really terrific uh, presentation. We have just a small token of our appreciation uh, of your talk here, uh, a little bit of a uh, um, something that you can put on your wall if you want. Uh, Eric, do you want to come on up and maybe we can uh, pose for take questions? Yes, and take questions. Okay. All right, we have two microphones. All right, so. Uh, you had time to think about your questions during picture <laughs> photo sessions. <laughs> So maybe to start out, you uh, showed uh, in one of your final slides gout uh, as uh, one of the diseases that you were interested in, and you had the uh, kidney tubule uh, highlighted, but nothing about inflammation, an area of, of great interest to me. And, and you know, in fact, one can target IL-1, for yeah. example, in terms of the episodes of gout. Did you find anything? So I should, be, I, should be, I should qualify how I actually described the result, because I think we did these analyses in a way where we're looking for the top enrichments, and, and we haven't, you know, one thing that's lacking from this field of heritability partitioning is something that's analogous to the way that you look for conditional contributions of SNPs to GWAS association. So, you know, what we should do is say, okay, proximal tubule, conditional uh -huh. on that, what's left? Uh -huh. And we haven't done that yet. Okay. There aren't good methods for that yet. I think that's uh -huh. something we're thinking about. Okay, well, uh, while There's we have a, that interchange, yeah. people at the microphones. Okay, uh, this was a really, really interesting talk. Thanks, Jay. Uh, I find your E, the CRISPR QTL data, particularly exciting. So, of the ones uh, that you found from your CRISPR QTL hits, the ones that didn't uh, have concordance yeah. from the high C data, what do you think is happening for those? So there, there are about nine explanations, possible <laughs> explanations, not, that are not mutually exclusive. So, one po so just to rattle them off partially, right? Ineffective CRISPR-I, right? That's, that's certainly a possibility. Experiment is not sufficiently sensitive to detect an actual effect. The effect is, you know, they are bona fide enhancers, but we're somehow missing the right context. Maybe the cells need a stimulation of some sort that might provoke it. Maybe they were enhancers, but we're looking at, you know, we're, 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 not, we're not going through the whole developmental history of the cell. This is just looking at one static time point. So that lack of dynamic framework is somehow resulting in missing it. What am I miss? I'm missing at least a few here. Uh, shadow enhancers, right? Meaning that they might be buffered by other effects and we haven't been looking at combinations. Or they're not enhancers, right? Maybe they code for some Maybe they are coding for some non-coding RNAs that might could act. be yeah could be could be could be something like that or you know my my own my own weak completely intuitive not data supported suspicion <laughs> is that they are biologically relevant um, but we're maybe lumping everything with those marks as enhancers when there's more heterogeneity in the actual functionality than we are appreciating but I could you know the other eight explanations are also on the table, and we're trying to now systematically go through them. Okay. Thanks. Hi, Jay. That was beautiful, as always. Um, how, as we expand these techniques to labs across the world using them, how much do you think we can realistically bring down the cost to make these more accessible to labs on a university funding scheme? Which technology were you talking about? I think all the multiplex technologies, <laughs> like there's obviously going to be different, different uh, pros and cons for each, but obviously not everyone has the kind of funding to do the experiment they want to do. So how can we make these technologies 
more affordable so people can design better experiments. So I would actually, I would say that the, the vast majority of what I described is not that expensive with the exception of the single cell profiling with the 10X platform, right? So, so that, that, you know, doing those 200,000 cells set us back a fair bit. Uh, our 2 million cell experiment, which we've now done more than once, set us back substantially less than that 200,000 cell 10x experiment. So, I, I, you know, it's not, there are ways of, I, I think, doing it um, that, that would make all, everything I talked about cheaper, right? Um, yeah, so, but I do, you know, the sky paradigm in particular, I do think that's the path. If we want sublinear scaling of costs, yeah, definitely. That it's hard to, you, you can't beat exponential, you, you need an exponentially scalable technology, right? And Absolutely. Maybe it'll take five rounds, but you know, <laughs> get there. Thank you. Hi. Um, this one? Yeah. Uh, so I noticed in your intergenic study, you were looking, or inter uh, your enhancer study, you were looking sort of um, prior to the promoter. Did you happen to look at any intergenic enhancers? And if so, what did you find? That's a great question. We deliberately excluded them from the, you mean, you mean, you mean gene body enhancers, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. We deliberately excluded them from the design because we were worried, as other studies have been, that sitting down a giant crab and crisper eye in the middle of the transcriptional unit would screw up expression in a way that wasn't actually connected to enhancing activity. Um, but so it remains a bit of a mystery. I mean, certainly there are intronic enhancers in tons of them. Right how to study them. I mean, if we could change this to a deletion-based framework mm -hmm. rather than CRISPR-I, I think I'd be more comfortable with that. Thank you. But it's, it's, it's important, so. Hi, Jay. Uh, in your CRISPR-I data, uh, when you look, you look at a distance effect, did you try to fit a function to see the dependency on distance and how that varies across different loci in the genome and whether that's quite universal across different cell types and, and different genes and pathways? Yeah, so everything you saw is everything we have. Meaning that that distribution is a that's a collated distribution across all genes, so I don't think we don't have the um, power to be able to make locus specific uh, distinctions. I, I do think we probably could um, look at it more and try to see more patterns than we have, but I think we would need to do a lot more cell lines and a lot more tiling before we're able to make those kinds of generalizations. Mm -hmm. But that is kind of the goal, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, to have a function. Right. You can imagine a function that takes into account distance. Um, sequence composition. What's that? Sequence, sequence composition, composition uh, and biochemical marks, you know, high C data, promoter, enhancer, pairing in terms of motifs, and, and tries to make a best guess. Right? right, right. But that DK you saw, it's like a 1 over X kind of thing that you see? or it's We like, did not fit it, but okay. we probably should have and okay. thought about how that relates to genome confirmation, which is a great question, but yeah. we haven't. Okay, yeah, we Thanks. need to do that. Cool. And so in the context of the uh, CRISPR-QTLs, um, I was wondering, are you thinking of looking for interactions, um, like pairs of enhancers that behave differently from any one of them? Yeah, so kind of a next phase of this will be to ask, you know, can we use the same framework to really look at, you know, it's one of those several alternative hypotheses for what's explaining the other 80% or 90% is looking at, at combinations. And you can, you can easily imagine the same framework being used for that. So that's, that's underway. But no answer. <laughs> so. All right. Well, uh, looks like we've exhausted the questions, <laughs> at least for now. So, Jay, thank you again. Great. Thank That's you. Really so fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.